Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, the true crime podcast from three friends sharing their perspectives from having years of 911 dispatch experience. Episode 2, Along for the Ride, Gabby Petito Story. Today, Brittany, Jess, and I discuss Gabby Petito's murder and the toxic environment that domestic violence can cause. So, my question to start today's episode is, how many domestic violence calls do you think you have taken and do any stand out? Oh, wow. Countless, right? I think that's one of the highest call volumes that I took. Mm Mm-hmm. As far as, like, the priority ones, not your shoplifting or your traffic accidents. I think that and suicidal subjects was probably top on the list, yeah? If I was working a swing shift on a weekend, so phones are really busy, I mean, you're looking at taking, what, five a shift? At least, I would at say. Least. I I mean, when you're working west, radio especially. Yeah. I don't know how many times I... Tone one out. Yeah. Yep. One stands out to me. I was on the phone with the victim. She was separated from the male, but she was the one that was talking about, I don't know why I keep going back to him. And she was like, thank you for being on the phone. And I kind of talked her into like, just talked her through her own thought process of you don't have to, you're not stuck. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be with him anymore. You deserve better than this. Giving her those reassurances that I think she needed. Yeah. That stands out to me just because it's that like human connection that you don't always get. Like you always want to connect with people, especially when you're helping them through something like that but you don't always get the chance to Mm -hmm. the violent ones always stick out the ones where the victim may be on the phone with you for a little bit and then you can hear the arguing again and you're like trying to get them to separate and or like when they're whispering because when they're whispering they're hiding from them yeah or anytime kids call in yeah. I remember I took one, I want to say like a teenager, but they were in the room with their younger brother and their, you know, parents were having it out in the living room. So they were calling that one. And then that, the first one I mentioned are the ones that kind of like stick out in my head for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that domestic violence is suicidal subjects and mainly family dispute calls were the majority of the calls that I took as a dispatcher. The few that stand out to me is I took one where it was a little kid and he had to be maybe nine or 10, and mom and dad were having it out in the living room, and they were hiding in the bathroom. They were visiting a place where you can go stay in a cabin, but it's within our city limits. They didn't know where it was, they didn't know the address, and they all they could t- keep telling me was it was a cabin. And then they were able to describe like a gas station that was nearby, and that helped me pinpoint it. But I could hear mom and dad arguing. It got real physical, and the mom was definitely taking the brunt of the father's anger, and this kid was hiding in a bathtub. And it seemed like a million years before somebody could actually get to them, but they got there pretty quickly, and they were able to figure it out and get help to that kid. But there were other kids in the cabin with them that couldn't get in the bathroom. And near the end of my call, I remember this specifically dad figured out the kid called 911 and was breaking into the bathroom to get to the kid you know your adrenaline's up so it was like your heart's beating and I just it, it was it felt like I couldn't get the cops there fast enough like the officers got there probably within seconds of dad of the phone disconnecting so it was not it's still terrifying to hear yeah but help was but help was right there so there was that one and then there was one where they actually called them out on on a non-emergency line so I couldn't get their location and no matter what I did I used all the resources that I could use whether it was phase two and for those of you don't know that sometimes when you call 911 we work with the phone companies for us to be able to get your like best estimated GPS location for where you're calling from whatever tower you're hitting off of sometimes it's really good sometimes it really sucks Um, It just depends on what the service is and how well it's going. Non-emergencies don't have access to that. It's only for 911. The lady wouldn't tell me where she was at. They got into a really heated argument. The phone disconnected and I never got to know if she ever got help. I looked up her phone number. They weren't in our in-house system. She never told me her name. She wouldn't. Definitely whisper tones. We had to use buttons a couple times. Yes or no questions. They never called back and I never found out. So that one's always been kind of with me where I really wish, I really hope she got the help that she needed because it was... It was hard to get, obviously, I still think about it, like it was hard to figure out what was going on. But yeah, so I think those are the two that stand out for me right now. I know I've taken plenty mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. it's been... They all are hard to hear. Yeah, 
very um just the level of people can just have like a like it's a simple verbal argument they're separated there's been no physical altercation it's truly just an argument to Mm -hmm. like some of the biggest like knockdown family brawls that you've ever heard i think the one that will always stick with me like you said there's tons of them they're all sad i was working at the highway patrol and at the highway patrol it's not very frequent that you get a domestic violence call really i mean sometimes there's rolling dvs that people call in which our story kind of has today and then that's it really so i didn't have a lot of experience taking dvs i think i've mentioned this call before i got a call from a lady we did get a plot on her location but she's in a moving vehicle and she's screaming and yelling and telling this guy to stop hitting her and She hung up and I don't know what ever happened to her. I tried to call her back a bunch of times. It didn't work. I tried to find her. We never found out if she was okay. I think that one was the hardest one for me because in the other calls that I've taken really, we've sent help and Mm -hmm. I knew that I, at least for that moment, I got help for them. Yeah. But when you don't know, like you say, it's, it's hard. It's sad. It's really sad. It is. Imagine a life on the road living out of your van with the person you think loves you the most in this world. Traveling from town to town and living life as one big adventure. Today's case is the story that rocked the world. It is about the murder of Gabby Petito, a 22-year-old woman who was dreaming of a life on the road with YouTube channel and Instagram to document it all. A woman that everyone knows about now. Her mother describes her as a beautiful and as a great artist. Her father describes her smile and her laughter as contagious. He said she never slowed down and was inspired by adventure. On July 2nd, 2020, Gabby and Brian were engaged. Brian and Gabby met in high school and had been together for just over two years when Brian asked Gabby to marry him. According to Gabby's mother, the two had called off the engagement but continued their relationship before they decided to go on a four-month trip across the country. Their adventure begins a year after their engagement, July 2nd of 2021, when Gabby Petito and one-time fiancé Brian packed up Gabby's van and hit the road. According to Gabby's Instagram timeline, the couple stopped at these locations. So on July 4th, they were at Monument Rock in Kansas. July 8th, they were in Colorado Springs. July 10th, they were at the Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. July 16th, they were at Zion National Park in Utah. July 21st, they visited Bryce Canyon. July 26th was Mystic Hot Springs in Utah. July 29th was Canyonlands National Park in Utah, and August 12th was the Arches National Park in Utah. On August 12th, about a month and a half into their trip, a 911 call was placed describing a domestic violence altercation between the couple. The caller described Brian Laundrie as slapping and hitting Gabby before jumping into their van. And so I have the 911 call. I'm going to pull it up and play some. Grant County Sheriff's Office. Were you able to get a description of the intoxication? Hi, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, uh, I'm calling. I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower, and we're driving by, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute. Florida with a white van, Florida license plate, white land, gentleman, Where's about it five, six beard. They just drove off. They're going down Main Street. They made a, uh, a right onto Main Street from Moonflower. Or what were they doing? But um, what do you say? What were they doing? Uh, we drove by, and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. Okay, you said uh, it's a white van? White van. I give you the, I give you the license plate if you give me one sec. I took okay. a picture of it. What kind of white van? Like a big one? Um, it, it was a smaller van. With the license plate of, it was white, Florida license plate QFT G03. It was, the make was a Ford, model was transit, black ladder on the passenger side. Black ladder, uh, passenger side. White Ford Transit. White Ford Transit. And where did they, so they turned, they headed south on Main Street from Moonflower Market? Correct. They made the right turn. Oh, so they went north. North. Yeah, sorry, I'm not from around here. Okay, are you so you're right there by the post office? Right across the street, yep. Okay, and and when they turned onto Main Street, they went right or left? Right. Right, so they went north. North on Main. All right, I will let somebody know. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Bye. Thanks. 
That's I'm frustrating to listen to. Yeah. Okay, like you were saying, was that not a really great RP? That was, that was phenomenal. Great. That's like what you want, right? Yep. We don't hear him ask descriptions for the people, but I bet you he could have given description of that. But you've got make, model, color, license plate, and direction of travel. And that he was slapping her. Yeah. And just for those, again. I'm sorry, did he turn R- right? Or <laughs> just for you guys to know, RP stands for reporting, reporting party. party. Yes, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I just. <laughs> that Good job, Kylie. Good catch. Good catch. <laughs> I. I still talk in dispatch talk at my new job and people look at me like I'm like, what are you saying? So I have to repeat myself. But the reporting party is on it. And I I do have a little frustration with that dispatcher because it's, we were always told things might be busy, but when you pick up the phone, you should be ready to listen. And And to write that stuff down. Yeah. Like you're immediately like, it doesn't matter what else is happening. Like, yeah, like we were required to also be on the radio at the same time as the phone. So we always had an ear out on our radio, but you're ready to write down. And sometimes like people want their call notes to be perfect when they enter in. Well, sometimes that doesn't happen. So sometimes you have the license plate first and mm-hmm. a direction of travel first before you have any other context, which is it's okay. It's more important to get the call in and get help on the yeah. way. Right. Mm-hmm. So for him to make him repeat multiple times, not only are you wasting valuable time, because as dispatchers, you have seconds to develop a rapport, to get the information. Like, yeah. sometimes your call doesn't last longer than a minute, if it, if that. It was a little frustrating to, not that we're here to critique a dispatcher, but it was frustrating to hear him make them repeat multiple times. And then by the end of it, it seems like he was getting on it. But yeah, he could have asked that RP for descriptions and that RP could have given him descriptions right away. And the fact that he had the information on that vehicle, that was well, did you notice the first thing he said was where he was? Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. dispatcher had to ask it. again. Mm-hmm. And then he asked again if the location was right across from the post office or whatever, which he said yes. I just felt like he kind of seemed irritated. Yeah, yeah, it crosses the line between confirming mm-hmm. and almost sounding disbelieving. Or like you don't really care. Yeah. Well, there it is again, right? Like when we were talking about, here I go again with another domestic violence. Yeah. Because it is a common call that you take. Oh, it's somebody arguing. You know what I mean? Like you, it becomes almost mundane because you know when you go to work, you're gonna take one. Yeah. But, like, we're trained. Uh, I know we get tons of domestic violence calls a day, but we're supposed to treat them each the same. And they should all be treated as important. And it didn't seem like he felt that urgency. No, it's interesting as to, to think about the next step for that dispatcher, right? So is he putting that in as a domestic violence call or is he putting it in as like suspicious an attempt to locate or, or suspicious or, verbal or yeah. disturbance, which yeah. is something yeah. that happens a lot. Because, yeah, that w- that's definitely the attitude you feel from it. The, the takeaway that it sounds like to me, the impression that I get listening to that is that was an ATL. That was an attempt to locate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He so. also, like, didn't get a description of the male subject or Gabby or... Yeah. Or, like, further, he was slapping the female. So, did you see anything else? Like, did he have any, any weapons? weapons? It's your job. Could you hear what they were saying to each other? Right. Like, it is your job as a dispatcher to get as much information as possible to give to your responding officers. Take the picture. You know that the officer is going to ask you. You know they're going to ask you, what does the vehicle look like? What did the people look like? What were the actions that were being taken? There's no mention of any weapons. Did you see any weapons? At least you're covering your basis, mm-hmm. right? Do you think that that maybe they were intoxicated or they were on drugs? Did you see anybody else around them? Yeah. You know what I mean? Was like, there anyone else? in the vehicle Anybody, did they yeah. have any kids yeah like, you see pets yeah these things like in the direction of travel was really good but to sit there also to make the comment oh so he was going north, north. yeah that's... that rp is not using directionals well and because they're, some people don't going. know right yeah. I, and, and also if you I say they're turning right from that yeah. location and that's something i learned too like so if somebody tells me oh i'm turning right on this street onto this street i know that that way's east Right. Or west. Yeah. I know that road goes east and west. I still so just I put it like... in the call exactly like they say it. Yes. Right. Well, and I think that's important to note, too. Obviously, in different circumstances where, you know, you're maybe taking a DTP shots fired, so disturbing the peace shots fired call where somebody heard a loud noise that's possibly a gunshot. A lot of people you talk to don't know directional. They don't know the cardinal directions, especially if you're standing in the middle of the street. I would say majority of people aren't familiar with those directionals, so mm-hmm. that's why you have to fill in those gaps for them like for us i'd be like okay so was it in the direction of the mountain or the direction of this 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm not asking them to amend their knowledge. I'm filling in those gaps. And that's your job as a dispatcher is like if they don't, you know what I mean? Like you said, it's not common for people to yeah. use directionals in their I, everyday I life. I didn't know so, that until I worked in law enforcement. I would give directions like go past the Home Depot yes, and turn left. left. Land. Like, so, you know yeah, what I mean? I mean? We use that all the time. Like, hey, so there's a Circle K gas station right there. Did yes. they drive by that or did they go away from it? Or yes. a common thing is, did they go towards the mall or yeah. did they go towards downtown? Yes. And then that will tell you, oh, it's they locations. went, east, they went Most west. people know locations. Right. And you can put in the call notes, reporting party advised vehicle went towards the mall. And then, you know what I mean? If they're reading that, you can put in the call note, potentially eastbound. I think my biggest concern, the most irritating thing was just, he, he was just like, okay. Urgency. Yeah. yeah. Which maybe no... that's just from him being the job. Maybe that's his normal. Yeah. Maybe that is him being urgent personality or he is newer to the job and because it is hard sometimes like you pick up that phone and your heart's yeah. racing and you're trying to do all this stuff and maybe somebody's talking to you and you're like oh man like what did they just say which direction was that so i i can or well, your can officer understand. talks to you on the air yeah sometimes i have to ask again you know like, yes other... i mean we've all we've all asked for repetition when we should have caught it the first time we've all done that because we're only human and yeah. he is too and i yeah. don't it's easy for us to sit here and talk about it now because we're not yes. Him. I just thought it was interesting and and I just didn't appreciate his lack of urgency. That's yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. Definitely agree. Like there, there is, is room for some... improvement. Yes. <laughs> improvement. But police do respond and it's Moab PD and there you can find the body cam footage which I watched most of it online on YouTube if you just look up Gabby Petito body cam footage and I'll put the link in the little blog post that we do about this. Mm-hmm. In the body cam footage of this incident, you can see the police pulling the couple in the van over. Gabby's seen on video obviously upset and crying. She claims that they were arguing and she was apologizing to Brian for being so mean. She also claims he locked her out of her own van, told her to calm down. She says he stresses me out. After speaking to Gabby, the officer then pulls Brian out of the car. When he speaks to officers, you can see that he's nervous and he's kind of stuttering and he just kind of looks like... Like, I just kind of wonder when I watched the video, I was like, is he on drugs or something? Like, like that twitchy... Yeah, he just seemed weird. He appears to have scratches on his face and the officer asks about the scratches. He says they're from Gabby and that at one point he pushed her. He claims that Gabby grabbed the wheel while they were driving and it caused him to hit the curb. He apologized for speeding multiple times and claims that he was just trying to keep everything calm and quiet. When police are interviewing Gabby, she admits she hit Brian when he was driving and was yelling at him. She says she hit Brian first and says that she has a lot of anxiety and stress and that Brian is typically pretty patient with her. So she said also in the video that the stress was related to her trying to start her YouTube and her Instagram and she said he doesn't really believe I can do it, which I'm like, well, then why'd you invite him on your trip? That's where I am now. Old Brittany would have probably been in the same spot that she was and it would have made me upset. New Brittany would be like, okay, you don't have to come. I'm not an expert, but from the research I've done on domestic violence, it sounds a lot like reactive abuse. According to Break the Silence, reactive abuse occurs when the victim reacts to the fis- or to the abuse they are experiencing. The victim may scream, toss out insults, or even lash out physically at the abuser, and the abuser then retaliates by telling the victim that they are, in fact, the abuser. Mm-hmm. And when I watched that video, that's like, because yeah. he locked her out of the van. Yeah. A lot of narcissistic traits. Traits, yeah. That, yeah, his um, behavior behavior seemed fidgety but when I watched the video I almost felt like it was a show. He yes. He was putting it on to make himself seem nervous so that he didn't 100% um, attract or he's... suspicion from law enforcement and he put it all because I did get this sense of calm about him like he just I he think knew he, that, that he... was an act the calm yeah. He needs everyone to think that he is this great person like a narcissist does but he's not. No. Mm. I'm not going to say this is typical. This is not the word I'm looking for but it seems like from what I've witnessed with domestic violence also like experienced a portion of that in my life when people do when they get into an argument they can both accept that not usually but some people can accept that they both had a part to play yes. and they'll admit that when law yes. enforcement gets involved oh well I did do this because eventually like that fear and the adre- like again the adrenaline and all this stuff of law enforcement responding mm-hmm. and it being this big situation but both parties will undoubtedly admit some Something some that form they of fault. some fold form of fault. Yeah, but what I've seen in like in any research that we're doing for this podcast and with like domestic violence, aggress like the aggressor or in serial killers, that that narcissistic personality they'll put up that calm and they don't. And I'm no expert, but this is just from what I've read and what I've like taken in is that not once will they ever admit or truly admit to 
fault. And if no, they do it's everyone else's fault. fault, they attribute it to a reaction something from something else. else. Correct. Whereas the victim is so distraught that they'll Everything. tell you the truth, but mm-hmm. then they'll take it back on themselves. Yeah, and they, I think too, when you're in a domestic mm-hmm. violence situation, like you said, knowing from like my experience, whenever my ex husband and I would get in an argument and it would escalate, he would always try to make me think that it was my fault. And for a long time, I believed him because you're stuck in this crazy world with this crazy person and you want everything to work out. And then you're like, well, maybe they tell you something and it they it, they just have to tell you it once. And you're like, well, maybe he's right. Maybe I did. I really do that. Like you question like yourself. Right? Yes. Like, yeah. And it's yeah. that. So you have a normal reaction. So like, let's say I like I came home. I came home and. I made dinner, but I didn't make the dinner that you wanted. You Mm -hmm. never told me that you wanted a specific dinner. I just made dinner. And you come home and you're like, this isn't what I want. And then you're already angry. So then you're going to take it out on me. And so me, for me to get, hey, I made dinner. I did this act of, this is me showing you that I care about you. Mm -hmm. This is an act and like, and if you don't want it, it's really not that big of a deal. Then you can make whatever you want. Like you have food in the fridge. There's your reaction to me making dinner is obviously like over an yeah. overstimulated thing you're upset about something else and you're taking it out on me and now you're mad that my reaction is to react yeah. to you being angry and then mm-hmm. they'll take that person like would t- is going to take that and say no no you're being unreasonable because you should be doing this mm-hmm. for me and you should be making me feel better and basically they see you as an object not a person yes correct and so that's what I get from, and just like from the history, they were engaged, they called it off, now they're back together. Like, it seems to be, there are already red flags. There was it's not a good relationship. It's not a good relationship. He's obviously not supportive of her. And he seems to have, like, I, I truly believe that Brian Laundry is a narcissist. I know he more. definitely has those tendencies. Mm-hmm. We'll, get to, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Yeah. When officers return to Brian to get more information, he explains that Gabby has been upset with him for being dirty and the van being messy. Did you notice he, like, doesn't wear shoes? Because he's all dirty and then he gets in with his dirty feet in their home. And as Jessica yells at us at the front door, or should yell us at the front door, <laughs> take your shoes off. He says there's a lot of little things. Try and explain how it all added up and cause the situations to spiral. In the video, he says he doesn't have a phone and that if they separate, he's on his own. He smiles too much, I think, in the video, and says when he pushed Gabby, she was already swinging. He also has scratches on his arms, and at one point he says, which this quote, I love Gabby. I hope she doesn't have any complaints about me. Because he knows she does. He knows yep. that he contributed to 100%. And at, I wonder what all Gabby could have told us. At one point, the officer asks him if he is on any meds or if he is normally this hyped up. Brian says no, and the lights made his heart race when he was pulled over. When separated, Gabby seems to have calmed down in the back of the cruiser and she was drinking water. One of the officers speaks to the witnesses or the witness, and after talking to him, thinks that Brian never actually hit her, which doesn't make sense to me because I, I didn't hear the other side of the phone call, but he clearly clearly says he, yes maybe he was nervous like sometimes people take back things like they question what they really saw like a wit you we know the statistics with witnesses yeah. with, so like maybe he was really questioning if he really saw that really maybe. saw yeah what he saw and that could be the like well if i didn't see this and i'm saying i'm making this mm-hmm. serious accusation this could be, turn out bad for the guy so am i am i sure Yeah. He says she clawed her way into the vehicle. The officer thinks that Gabby is the primary aggressor in the incident and they talk about how the safety is hard to maintain because they live in the same vehicle. They say that they can arrest her, but they aren't sure that that's the right decision. They discuss the he said, she said situation and think the truth is somewhere in between, which oftentimes it is. is. The officer decides they can charge Gabby with a citation and that with that citation, there will be a no contact order in place for the safety of Brian and he can go to the PD during business hours and have it dropped if he wants to. They talk about how the couple probably will not want to be separated even after this incident, which is true. Mm -hmm. The officer explains to Brian that they have to do something about the situation even if they don't want to take the 22-year-old to jail. Brian offers to go to jail and said, and the officers say, you did nothing wrong. My question is how they could know that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Don't ever say absolutes. Yep. Don't I make hate, promises. I hate absolutes. Mm-hmm. And also, you're an investigator. You're supposed to be investigating both sides. Yeah. I wonder why they weren't questioning why she was so upset and what led to him locking her out of the car. Why he did that. It's her car. It seems like they mostly speak with him and take his side because Gabby admitted that she did hit him. In this situation, I wonder why they both weren't charged and maybe booked or, you know. Further investigation. Yeah. Done. Like maybe a supervisor should have been called to that scene. Somebody. Yeah. I'm not saying that the officers didn't have experience, but maybe. Well, one of the officers was training, but maybe his trainer should have called a sergeant or somebody to get another point of view. Yeah, exactly. Because she also had marks on her. So I'm sorry, but how do you know? Do you know what I mean? And law enforcement needs more training in domestic violence. They need more training in realizing that the abuser oftentimes will make the victim feel like the abuser i don't know i just feel like there needs to be some more training i agree because like it's hard for a victim to really like when my ex-boyfriend and i when i finally broke it off with him i was adamant about telling everybody no physical nothing happened Mm -hmm. like no physical harm ever well it's embarrassing came to me in a way yeah that you stayed so long like you kind of feel embarrassed well, and it felt like, like, it's hard for me to talk about still, which is why I don't, I'm still working through the stuff that I went through with him. Like victims, I blamed myself for a really long time that I brought that on myself, that I brought. You were conditioned that, to think that. Yeah. That. They kind of brainwash you. Yeah. Like I deserved, it's beside the point, right? Like clearly I'm still working through some stuff and I think I'll always be working through trying to process what that relationship was but I never I felt like I never wanted to make them the bad guy I never wanted I didn't want to hurt them still even though I had gone through all this hurt myself well you also feel kind of loyalty because you love that person I think too so maybe she felt a little bit of yeah so I can see where she's coming from and like for me in watching that video she was so distraught it was like heartbreaking to watch it it is really heartbreaking to watch and like For those of us who have been in that position where you're like, you're not thinking in the right, you know what I mean? Like if you were out of that situation, you had time to process it and you were living a normal life, not in a van with him. Yeah. That's stress right now. (laughs) And I I quote normal because what is normal? I don't think I could live with anyone in a van. Right? You wouldn't react. Your reaction, you would know what your reaction was, which is like, it just was heartbreaking because it just felt like she was so overwhelmed. She didn't know how to speak her truth. Well, when your feelings are way out of control and then add on top of that, the stress of the police being there and not, not, like not wanting to get them in trouble, not wanting to admit that you're living in this situation. Yes, exactly right. The brainwashing and the manipulative part of it that the victim goes through in thinking that if they do something wrong and the relationship ends no one will ever love them like yeah, that one because person does. and the, and abusers make them think that yeah i don't know how many times i was told no one will ever love you yeah you're ruined and that you believe that and she probably wanted her fairy tale she probably did love him oh, a lot yeah i don't think that as the things that i've read about him things i've seen i don't think that he loved her probably i don't think he was capable of that that's just my opinion i am not an expert I do want to say that in many domestic violence relationships, the relationship doesn't end after an arrest, which we all know here, or after a phone call. On average, it takes at least seven attempts to leave before a victim leaves their abuser for good. And leaving is the most dangerous time for the victim. And in fact, each day, three women in the U.S. are murdered by a current or former intimate partner. For two more weeks, the couple continued their trip across the U.S. And in, later in August, the couple reached Wyoming. A couple saw Gabby crying at a Mexican restaurant and said Gabby seemed very angry and that he was creeping them out. Those are quotes. This is likely the last time that Gabby was seen alive by anyone aside from Brian. And on August 25th, Gabby posted her last Instagram post, which may or may have not been her. On August 30th, her mother received a text from Gabby's phone, but she did not believe that it was Gabby who had texted her. Her mother said that Gabby usually updated her every other day. She said she told Gabby to be careful, be safe. She said, and I quote, be careful, be safe, be aware of your surroundings, and don't trust anyone. She told 60 Minutes Australia that she felt she her daughter would be safe because she was with Brian. Around day four or five of not hearing from her, her mother began to worry, and that's when she noticed there were no posts on her social media. Her name's Nicole, the mother. She tried to contact Brian and his family and got no response. After 10 days with no contact, she reported Gabby missing. On September 11th, a detective let Nicole know they had gone to the laundry house to do a welfare check or to see if they could figure out where they were, and Brian wasn't missing, and he had been home for two weeks. He 
had returned with Gabby's van, but no Gabby. When questioning Brian, he asked for a lawyer immediately. And Nicole says, after that, we didn't sleep. We focused on getting Gabby's face out there in the hopes that she would be found. The van was searched the same day. Although Brian Laundrie was named a person of interest in the case and was being closely monitored by authorities, on September 17th, 2021, Brian Laundrie was reported as missing. Officers had been doing surveillance on his house and had confused his mother for him. And according to his parents, he had gone hiking and didn't return. Police and Gabby's parents begged the laundry to family to speak to them and to give answers. And their lawyers even made like public pleas for the family and it did nothing. As we all know, Gabby's story was all over the media outlets and the public was also sharing her story all over TikTok and other social media. Everyone began kind of their journey as armchair detectives in this story. And all this detention really did help the case. So Kyle and Jen Bethune were also living living a van life and sharing their story on social media. And in late August, the couple passed Gabby's white van with its Florida plates in the Grand Teton National Park. They captured video of the van on their GoPro. And after seeing like all the coverage on the social media and everything, Jen went back to look at the footage because she remembered that the plates were from Florida because Kyle and Jen are also from Florida. Mm. So they had wanted to stop and talk because I guess that's a normal thing for van life, which is another reason I could never do that because people... <laughs> After realizing that she was also missing, like she was missing and that she had a Florida plate too, she went back to look through the footage and she saw that it was Gabby's van. And on September 19th, after Jen and Kyle had called the FBI to give them that information, Gabby's body was found just 300 meters from where her van had been parked. I didn't, I, I, I have no presence on social media, so this is literally all brand new to me. Like mind blowing. Yeah. Well, not mind Well, see, I learned about the case on TikTok. I didn't even know about it until TikTok. And then that's when I was like, oh, I need to look into this further. And then it kind of blew up because of all the social media posts. For because sure. we're in the middle of a pandemic. And what else are people going to do? Yeah. <laughs> everyone has all the time in the world to be armchair detectives. Yeah. But well, look at how much people, if you think about um, Don't Fuck With Cats. Yes. That Netflix. Yes. How, yeah. how serious people can get. Serious people can get. Mm. And it doesn't just take a detective to help solve a case. Well, like, yeah. There's a lot of people out there. Nobody had the time like she did to go through everything and figure out exactly really where that picture was from. Sit there and, and look at stuff where detectives don't, I mean, they've. it's not just the only case that they're handling. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I know sometimes people get frustrated with that stuff, but I'm thankful that there's people out there that are like, yeah. oh, screw this, I'm going to help. Well, yeah, I so. think because of the social media presence, the case progressed a lot faster than it would have if it I'm sure. hadn't. I'm sure. Well, had that not been a thing, they wouldn't have found they never would have known. She I, never would have known to go back and check at that van to see if it was the same. Yeah, and I think either they wouldn't have found the body for a long time or they just never would have found it. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Weeks later, the autopsy revealed that the manner of death was homicide by blunt force trauma to the head and neck and strangulation. Which, I did not know this in all of the research I've done, but if a person puts their hands on your neck, they are seven and a half times more likely to kill you. But I wonder if maybe that was not the first time that he kind of... Oh, I, I doubt it was the first time. On September 22nd, the U.S. District Court for the District of Wyoming issued a federal arrest warrant for Mr. Laundry. The warrant was issued pursuant to the federal grand jury indictment for a violation of federal statute 18 U.S.C. Use of unauthorized access devices, and that was related to his activities following Gabby's death. According to the court records, he stole her credit card and used it for his trip home without her. I think that he spent like $1,000 or something out of her account. Later, it would be revealed that he had $20,000 in his own accounts. The FBI also stated that Brian was attempting to deceive law enforcement by giving the impression that Miss Petito was still alive by continuing to text yeah. other phones so that they would believe that she was still alive. This to me, like the fact that he stole her money when he had his own money was just like a last she, slap in the face. Oh kind yeah. Of. Like she, she, it's clear that her and all of her belongings were just things. Yeah. Just things to him. And he didn't care about her. On August 20th, 37 days later, search crews found the remains of Brian Laundry. He was found in the area of the Carlton Reserve, north of the Laundry Homes in Florida. This is just hours after his parents, who had, hadn't been involved in searching for him because he had been reported as a missing person. How many? On September 17th, he was reported as missing, right? On October 20th, so almost a month later. Oh, 37 days later. <laughs> they refused to get involved in the search and then From hours the or? yeah they weren't cooperating with police they didn't want to search okay. nothing
nothing. They wouldn't make a statement. They wouldn't say anything. The only thing they did was report him missing. They found him within hours of getting involved in the search, which makes me wonder, did they know where he was the entire time? Did they know what his plan was? There, yeah, there's no such thing as coincidences, especially no. something like that. hundred percent. With his body was a backpack, a notebook, and a firearm. His cause of death was a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. In the notebook, Brian had written a confession to killing Gabby Petito, and they just released that recently in the news. So there still remains a lot of questions that I think the public want answered, and the big question for everyone is why. And I honestly think, I know we'll never know. I think that he was losing control over her and he knew that. And he, maybe Gabby threatened to leave. Maybe this police incident re made him realize he didn't have the control that he really thought he did. Plus you're in a small space living together, well, that, yeah. which no, escalates everything. And he probably had, like a lot of them have, if I can't have you, no, no right, one can. else can. I, I, I think to touch on the note of the incident when the police were actually called, mm -hmm. that worked out okay for him yeah right police he was like oh and, i'm and not gonna get to caught him, but he was told he did nothing wrong yeah i'm also not an expert but they know they like in the back of their head they know they shouldn't be doing this but they're doing it because they need to because mm -hmm. the victim needs to have this done otherwise they're not going to behave correctly or whatever scenario their brain comes up with as why Which this is okay we'll never understand yeah <laughs> So that only further drives him in deeper into that mental delusion that he has, that she deserves what he's doing. Because the police officer said he did nothing wrong. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they were on his side. Yeah. Well, it makes me wonder, so first off, in the video with the police officers, you can see, and I remember watching this, and I remember watching this, Gabby making that closed fist Oh, sign. interesting. I didn't see that. And I, I watched I'm for it, sure, but I, I don't know. Pretty sure you can see her making the hand movement. I remember she's sitting in the van. She's sitting in the back of the police car, and I think she makes it there. I know it's been put out there that law enforcement knows this. Law enforcement does, does not, not know this. I did not know about mm -hmm. this sign until TikTok. But it makes me wonder with how much social media was involved with this case and how much media attention it this case got how they didn't go back to look at their videos oh. and, and, and double check that it was like well a, also i wonder too if that was created after i remember we're doing it but maybe my brain is faulty maybe it was something different but it makes me wonder why either why this this signal isn't being put out more towards law enforcement law enforcement's not mm -hmm. making an effort to learn it and like at least it. sending an email out about it or something some or sort of yeah bulletin. yeah or like what's going on so that's one of my frustrations with this is that she, so even with all the media attention why that was never caught and why once that was kind of brought to light nothing kind of went forward with that and then the other i think by then she was well i think she was deceased already, yeah you know, missing and then the other thing is, is wasn't it reported so it was reported that they had found brian laundry's teeth but not his body i think at first originally it was reported that but i mean if they know that his cause of death was a gunshot, gunshot. wound to the head i I think they have to have more than just his teeth. Right. Forensically, they couldn't say that was his cause of death unless they had that to say it was his cause of death. Because I so forgive me if you mention this. Did they give a time of death? They did not. Okay. So just curious, like maybe that's why parents weren't looking because they knew. It just says it just says his remains were found one month after she was strangled to death. It, we know timeline. Oh, he was home for two weeks. His skeletal remains were discovered oh. in the swampy some creek that I'm not going to try and say. M Y A K K A H A T C H E E. The environment aids in the decomposition mm -hmm. for sure. And if it was just his skeletal remains, maybe animals had taken... For sure. I mean, it's Florida. Well, Crazy shit happens in Florida. In for a while, like while they were looking for him, it was underwater. Yeah. So they didn't have access oh, okay. to that area okay. until okay. later. Okay. So I'm sure... Which fish, I'm sure, probably helped pick it clean, too. Or turtles or... Yeah. Alligators. Yeah, Except I heard alligators don't really yeah. eat humans, but... Not they an food. alligator expert. You're not? No. Oh, all right. <laughs> How long was she missing to when they found her body? A couple weeks. Right? Yeah, it was a while. Brian had... I remember Brian was missing, and people were reporting that they had seen him in all these different places. And oh, I, for yes. sure, 100%, I thought he was in Mexico. Like, I thought he was gone. I just thought bailed. he yanked out his teeth and he hopped a boat to Cuba. A hundred percent. I thought that was not his body. I thought yeah. they probably found his belongings and he killed someone else. He's a freaking psychopath. And then when they said it was his body after evidence and all that stuff, then I was like, oh, that's anticlimactic, but okay. Um, also kind of like you There's take no this woman's justice. life. Yeah. yeah. And then you're, you 
can't even face what you did. Yes. It's not fair. It's not fair to her family. It's not fair to her. Let's see. So she, we don't know really how long because we don't know when she really went so missing. do we know when, and we may not, but I'm asking you, <laughs> the other Florida couple had seen the van. Did they have a timestamp on um, when they last? Because that would have at least They have to have had time. a timestamp, but. We may not know. On August 25th, that was her last Instagram post. And on August 30th, she she texted her mom. So he, August 12th, they were at in Utah. And then that's when that incident had been. So after that, she was seen by the couple. And they were at a Mexican restaurant or something. And then... I know that hundreds of people all over the country have done this. But I want to write out the timeline. No, that's why I think everybody was so into this case. Because the timeline is insane. Well, that's where the biggest question is. Is like, we don't really know when she was truly murdered so the 25th august 27th through the 30th is when they believe she disappeared and then it doesn't have a date for when those people yeah well that's a lie that's another thing i meant to bring up because he had a i think he had a phone it just connected to the wi-fi maybe i don't know oh like no service but internet yeah Mm -hmm. because he took that phone with him when they dropped him off at the hotel so that's another thing if he's lying to the cops and saying i don't have a phone it's just weird and the truth the honest truth is is that i think his parents knew i think that i think he came home or maybe even called before he came home who knows and confessed everything and i think they aided him i thought they were gonna aid him in leaving and i thought for sure oh he may have been reported missing but he's probably been gone for a while maybe they meant for him to go missing and maybe he couldn't survive in that all of these posts about how he was a survivalist or something maybe he really didn't wasn't the survivalist he thought he was maybe he got injured and he was like fuck they're gonna catch me and then he shot himself well i'd be interested like maybe it did finally eat away at him and he told his parents like i'm gonna take off if you don't hear from me by this point oh because they knew where to find him i just that's yeah weird to me the fact that they didn't help and as soon as they did they were he was found he came home. It's all suspicious. I think he came home when the police came in, found him there, and they'd been home for two weeks. I think they knew, shit, this is real, and yeah. we don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Well, I they have all this attention chose, on them, too. I think he chose, oh, I've been living out of a van. I'm a survivalist. I'm going to go in the woods. They won't be able to find Maybe me. Maybe I can return when things are safe. Tell mom and dad where I'm at until they can figure out what's going on. Mom and dad, because it's weird that mom and dad have no contact, right? Mm-hmm. They report your, you report your kid missing but you and refuse to cooperate yeah. yeah you know something more and you just don't want to talk to them your lawyers they are knew the advising whole you not time to do it. and maybe that's why they didn't want to help and well they're not being charged with anything in connection to her death so yeah, which is insane to, to me to, to try because couldn't but couldn't they have like I mean, ate it what is it called where you yes or like where you prevent prosecution what's that called i know what you're talking about but I don't remember. harboring harboring if you harboring? no like no. where you 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 can help but you're preventing prosecution of that or hiding her helping hide her body because they're keeping that location oh, uh, an accomplice anything yeah. um, there's so many things i think that they could I think try the family, for family the family can seek that and try to press charges i don't and maybe a wrongful death suit is, or but something I, because of what i don't think the off truly i don't i think they knew i think he disappeared to the woods i think that his conscious got to him and he took his life that's why mom and he i just think he's a big he piece was. of trash so yeah <laughs> They told, at that point, they realized, oh, we really can't. He's not answering. We can't, really can't find him. He hasn't contacted us. They knew where he was. And at this point, I think, unfortunately, they made moves where they're so private about everything that I don't think officers have a lot to go on to charge them. Mm-hmm. Now, the family could probably, like, hire their own investigator. and But they have to have, like, it could, it's just what officers have for the parents is so weak that it wouldn't hold up in court. Yeah. So I don't, I think that's where they're at with it. So unfortunately for Gabby's family, it's rap and it sucks. I think that they know that they had a lot to do with this, but they mm-hmm. don't have the evidence, which sucks to truly. I just think they are all trash humans, that whole family mm-hmm. and him. And just like his sister was like, screw this, like screw my brother was mm-hmm. not happy with him whatsoever. But I think mom and dad, like I get that they love their son, but at this point, like, you know what your son did, you know how this works. And I get that you want to do everything because you think maybe your son was a victim and his stuff. But after all of this stuff and watching all this stuff and what she's been trying to do your son was a 
butthole. Yeah. And, like, I think that well, 90% of anybody watching this is going to agree. They live with his family. So I'm sure that they probably heard their arguments or saw some kind of signs or knew something was going on, I think. Yeah. And how could they not know, you know? So it's, I don't know. I think mom and dad definitely <laughs> aided and abetted. I think mom and dad harbored a fugitive at that point. I think for their sake, he left. He knew that his parents would eventually be investigated and he didn't want them to get charged. I think that there's still a lot of questions. I'm sure that notebook has a lot more in it than oh, we, we don't yes. know. Yeah, yes. I'm interested and hopefully maybe we'll do an update, but I'm interested to know exactly what was said to you. I tried um, to find the statement that they were talking about. At this point, I both parties are deceased. The case, I don't think the case can move forward. mm with the parents so eventually they're going to close this case and people will have access to that well most of it you'll have access to and you can probably request and pay for police reports evidence which i'm sure lots of people will do which i really think there's going to be a long wait list for they're going to make a lot of kind of like with Stephen avery yeah remember when um making a murder was so big and they had to hire additional people just to make copies Mm -hmm. of police reports So I think that this is one of those cases where, too, where it's, I mean, you're going to have, we're always going to have questions. Oh, yeah. We're always like, I do feel really bad for Gabby and I feel awful for her family and I can't imagine what they're going through and I'm not going to make my opinions. I mean, I think everybody can guess my opinion on Brian Laundrie and his family. I think that if you know information at this point, you need to just release it. And yeah, and there's no reason to hide it the anymore. Adult. And if you're going to get charged, you're going to get charged and accept the responsibility because while I can understand a love for your child, at the same time, it doesn't excuse what, what they did. Saying? What I was saying was like the narcissistic personality like I think he has traits but I also think a true narcissist couldn't go through with killing themselves because they think so highly of themselves so that's the only thing that makes me think maybe he's not a narcissist. A statement made by the FBI said all logical investigative steps have been concluded in this case. The investigation did not identify any other individuals other than Brian Laundrie directly involved in the tragic death of Gabby Petito. The primary focus throughout the investigation was to bring justice to Gabby and her family and the public's role in helping us on this endeavor was invaluable as investigators was covered in the media around the world. On behalf of the FBI, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the public for the thousands of tips that were provided during the investigation and to our local, state, and federal law enforcement partners for their work throughout the investigation. Gabby's parents have since started the Gabby Petito Foundation, and on the foundation's website, their mission statement includes these words. The mission of the foundation is to address the needs of the organizations that support locating missing persons and to provide aid to organizations that assist victims of domestic violence situations through education awareness, and prevention strategies. We wish to turn our personal tragedy into a positive one. It is our hope that Gabby's foundation will bring these important issues into the forefront of the public eye to the benefit of all of our communities. If you or someone you know thinks they are in a domestic violence situation, please visit the domestic violence support page or call 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. You can also text the word START to 88788, and if you or someone you know is in distress and feels like they can't go on, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit the Suicide Prevention website. Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Instagram and Facebook at Truth, Lies, and Alibis.